Um, so we're going to have uh, a short uh, five minutes uh, from Stefano first before we move on to the main lecture from Schubert. Um, so uh, Dr. Stefano Ferrati uh, is from ESA. Uh, he's a, an ESA space policy officer. Um, and I believe he's seconded to the European Space Agency or the European Space Policy uh, Institute, um, managing research for um, space for sustainable development. Um, so that's why he uh, is very topical uh, as we move on to uh, water quality and human health uh, as a module within this course. Um, so uh, he is going to just talk for a few minutes really around um, ESA and their links with a number of um, not just satellites and sensors, but the, the projects uh, and points of interest uh, that are relevant to uh, the topic under discussion today. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Stefano for a few minutes. Thanks, Stefano. I think we have the presenter mode there, uh, Stefano. You don't want to swap displays. And um, Stefano, you're also still on mute. Yeah. So thanks, everyone. Um, let me let me present a bit uh, uh, what we are doing in the science applications and climate department of the Earth Observation Directorate of the European Space Agency in the uh, context of uh, space and health. Uh, so um, space uh, uh, has uh, a key role uh, also to play in the uh, global public health domain. Uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, international frameworks which uh, are under the umbrella of the United Nations that are also related to, to the theme of health. Uh, the first one is the United Nations Agenda 2030 and its associated uh, sustainable development goals. In particular, there is SDG number three, uh, which is uh, dedicated to uh, health and well-being. But uh, we can also say that uh, all the others uh, uh, 17th uh, SDGs um, are somehow interlinked with with else. Um, yeah. Could you just could you just press the swap display button at the top, just to swap the uh, at the minute we've got presenter mode, so it's a little bit small. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, the second uh, framework, which is the Sendai framework for disaster uh, um, uh, risk reduction, uh, which was established uh, uh, by the United Nations with the aim uh, to uh, support uh, countries and member countries uh, after a disaster strike. And in this case, uh, uh, the space community got together uh, uh, through the International Charter of Space and Major Disasters uh, to supply uh, Earth observation data uh, uh, to the civil protection agencies that intervenes uh, after a disaster. The third framework is the uh, COP20, the COP framework, and in particular uh, uh, here we mentioned the Paris Agreement. Uh, space provides more than 50% of the essential climate uh, variables data. Uh, therefore, monitoring the environment and the climate change uh, uh, on the planet is uh, is one of the priorities uh, for uh, for the space community. Uh, and satellite data is essential to this end. So in this context, um, 
we are uh, we are thinking and we are starting activities at ESA uh, in order to uh, ensure that uh, um, public health is addressed uh, in the best possible uh, way uh, through our program. Uh, here you see a few examples uh, of uh, of what we are doing. Uh, so we started in 2019 uh, with a project called uh, Artificial Intelligence and Earth Observation as Innovative Methods for Monitoring Western Nile Virus Spread. Uh, we know that uh, zoonotic diseases, so vector-borne diseases, are spreading also uh, to the northern hemisphere. Uh, we know that in Europe, uh, particularly Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal, are, uh, uh, Greece as well, are impacted uh, by, by these uh, uh, tropical diseases. And uh, of course, uh, uh, aquatic ecosystems are, uh, are uh, let's say, the prerequisite for, uh, for the vectors uh, to, to develop and to, uh, and to grow. Uh, we also explored the uh, innovative uh, um, uh, tools for big data exploitation. So, in addition to artificial intelligence, also big data exploitation techniques have been applied, in particular to uh, air pollution and uh, to, uh, again, uh, uh, water contamination um, using uh, satellite data. Uh, we also discussed uh, in a dedicated workshop uh, what could be uh, the conditions to improve urban resilience in terms of health. And uh, we started afterwards a project uh, uh, to study the E. coli concentration uh, in the Bay Area of Dublin in Ireland uh, through the development of an alert data service dedicated to it. At the same time, we always keep a look at uh, capacity building activities. Uh, this uh, series of webinars and trainings is part of it, but we also uh, encourage startups and young entrepreneurs uh, to uh, create a commercial uh, uh, endeavors uh, in the domain of health and space. And so you see here that through our ESA commercialization gateway, we had a dedicated event uh, on healthcare. We started uh, the project Wigeon uh, together with uh, with the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and uh, thanks to Shuba for bringing this forward uh, together with your team. Uh, Gemma is also with us today. She is the project manager of this activity. And uh, it's very interesting to see also how uh, we can contribute to the, um, uh, let's say, monitoring of the uh, Indian region of Kerala vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, spread of waterborne diseases in the region uh, that was particularly affected by flooding in the last years. Uh, we had uh, the Living Planet Symposium last year. It's our yearly, uh, well, three yearly conference, uh, which attracted more than 5,000 uh, scientists from all over the world. And we had four sessions dedicated to the theme of health and Earth observation. Uh, it was very successful. All the material is also online. So all the participants to this training can also go there and check uh, what is the state of the art of their research um, in, in, the, in these various uh, uh, subdomains. Uh, lately, we started a project on the study of urban green and how this is related to health. So it includes also eat islands in the cities, and uh, the green is also studied uh, uh, as, a, as an environment that can lead to the, uh, to the spread of uh, vectors uh, that uh, can benefit from the, from the green to, to develop. So monitoring the health status and, um, and the green uh, uh, environment is essential also uh, to, to predict uh, the eventual spread of uh, vector and, and, and waterborne diseases as well. Uh, on the 19th of April, we opened uh, an invitation to tender. It's called uh, Earth Observation for Health Resilience. Uh, it will be open uh, until uh, uh, beginning of June. 
and uh, we will be addressing uh, their uh, the creation of a virtual platform where we embed all the earth observation and epidemiology data uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, we also will develop a couple of services uh, one associated to the blue environment uh, and we have as the stakeholders the who the world health organization and the european center for disease control as well as the green environment uh, where we have uh, the food uh, and agriculture organization of the united nation and their veterinary services uh, involved and uh, finally i invite all of you to uh, consult our website on uh, earth observation for society uh, uh, on the isa website and you will find uh, various information both on health resilience and uh, on the health topic uh, in general with this i would like to uh, to pass uh, now uh, the word to uh, to shuba uh, thanking again uh, all the participants and uh, remaining available uh, to all of them uh, if there is any specific question on what isa can actually do uh, in order to improve uh, and increase uh, the capacity building uh, initiatives uh, all over the world on the on the theme of health and earth observation thank you and please shuba the floor is yours thank you very much stefano for that a very excellent introduction on uh, isa activities related to today's topic tom you just say yeah could you just move your microphone up a little it's a bit quiet is that better? Much better, thanks. Okay, shall I start? Okay, so thank you all for coming to today's session. Today, we are starting a set of four lectures in the module dealing with uh, water quality and human health. Before I launch into the lecture proper, let me say a few words about Trevor Platt, in whose honor we are doing this training. Um, some of you may have heard of him or have known him as an outstanding scientist. Some of you may have not may not have heard of him before this event. But for me, he was also a student. I knew him as a student a perpetual student who always loved to learn new things. Only a few years ago, he was following a course on advanced mathematics on the YouTube from a famous mathematician. He didn't just follow the course, he bought the books relevant by the same uh, lecturer. He did the exercises, his commitment was total. I hope that you will um, let him inspire you and let this course be the beginning of a long lasting love affair with learning if you haven't already established that relationship. So let me now um, go to the talk itself. And you will tell me if everything is looking good in a minute. Is that good? That's great, Shiva. Okay. So uh, today we are starting a, this uh, set of presentations and discussions on water quality and human health. So how does water quality relate to human health? There are beneficial effects from water and the oceans related to the direct effects from the environment and related to the high quality food that we get from water. There are also negative effects, which include harmful algal blooms, infectious diseases, deoxygenation of the waters and hypoxia, and so on. So if I begin with the positive effects, let's think about something as simple as going to the beach. Now, you may think that you do this for the fun of it if you take a trip with your family or friends to the beach. 
But in a recent article uh, for the common people on environment and health related topics, a journalist, Jessica Booth, listed some 10 health benefits that accrue from going to the beach. And they are listed here. That includes vitamin D from the sunshine, reduced pain, better sleep, better lungs, reduced depression, and so on. You may argue that some of these benefits arise from just being outdoors and uh, being active. But some of them are indeed related to the specific properties of seawater, such as the anti-inflammatory properties. They call it salt therapy re related to salt in the seawater or to the smell of the ocean, which are uh, rich in uh, negative ions, the atmosphere above the seawater. So whatever reason you go, you might go to the beach, you do want to make sure that water quality will be one of your criteria for selection for where you might want to go. So in this very simple context, and if you recall previous lectures, especially the one from Son, you might have learned, or you should have learned by now, that there are several indicators of water quality that are available to us through remote sensing from satellites. And of course, chlorophyll concentration is considered a good indicator of water quality in many ways. And we have heard a lot about water quality. Uh, and Sorry, we've heard a lot about chlorophyll from satellites. But there are other properties such as the diffuse attenuation coefficient, turbidity, water color, water clarity, suspended sediment load, the euphotic zone, and so on. And just about all of them are available to remote sensing. And the advantage of using a satellite-based method is that you can look at this problem at multiple scales. You could do it at the global scale. You can look at it at the regional scale, or you can look at it in a very local scale depending on the problem that you are dealing with, you have a choice. But let me recall something that we have discussed in earlier lectures, and that is when you come to regional and local scales, and the more you shift to using visible spectral radiometers that were designed for land applications, you begin to make compromises and the solutions become more difficult. And it is always useful under these circumstances to have local observations for algorithm development or for validation. And it's also important to test various steps, atmospheric correction, in-water algorithms, and so on. And I think you will find that you never have enough data so if somebody can get more data to improve your methods, the better it would be. Now, Gemma next week will um, discuss these things in more detail. But the other health benefit from the sea re are related to food. We um, know that we can uh, derive high quality, high protein food from the sea mainly as fish and seafood. But the fish or seafood are also a source of certain essential um, fatty acids that are not produced by um, the fish themselves, but they are derived from phytoplankton. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was little, my mother used to force me to drink shark liver oil. Terrible taste, terrible smell, but you had to, I had to drink it, my brother too, because it was supposed to be good for you. The reason lies in these essential fatty acids. But now there are actually products that you can buy 
that are um, sold as being helpful for longevity, they are superfoods, and what are they? They are, you're bypassing the, the fish and you are going straight to the marine phytoplankton, which produce the fatty acids, which are then um, consumed by fish, and then you get the fatty oil in the fish. So according to Amazon, you can buy 100 grams of this uh, superfood derived from phytoplankton if you have 100 pounds and more of uh, cash. So if you then go back to the fish, fisheries production and the revenue from fish depends on primary production by phytoplankton which uh, depend on the, and of course the fish yield will depend on the magnitude of primary production and the phenology, which is the time sequence of the seasonal events in the phytoplankton dynamics. The primary production also depends on water quality. So we are back to water quality and the water quality indicators or aspects that are relevant for primary production include light penetration, water quality, water clarity, and water color. I'm not going to go into details on this, but you will hear more details about it further down this uh, training course. Bob Bruin will be talking about primary production and uh, Dionysius right source will talk about indicators of e ecosystem status. Now, I did mention the essential fatty acids. So these essential fatty acids are considered to be essential, and that's why they're called essential fatty acids, for health and survival of vertebrates. Now, different kinds of uh, classes of phytoplankton produce different types of these fatty acids. Some are produced exclusively by diatoms. Some of them are produced, uh, I mean, diatoms also produce uh, another one called the EPA, which you may know more familiarly as the an omega-3 fatty acid. Eggs are supposed to be rich in those omega-3 acids. There are concerns now that as fish communities change their distribution and abundance, there could also be a link to the availability of these essential acids from the ocean. Now, you may be surprised to know that there are methods to monitor some aspects of the distribution of these uh, essential fatty acids from remote sensing. In the work that I am referring to, we went from chlorophyll and diatoms to a, a relationship between diatom and the fatty acid EPA to map the EPA in these regions. The interest uh, was to see if the EPA production by phytoplankton is sufficient to meet the increasing demands for EPA from the oceans. Now, supporting a fish yield from the ocean can also be achieved through support to fisheries op operations, where one can use satellite-based methods to predict areas where you might find rich fishing. The object, and many countries are doing that, and the objective, of course, is not to overfish or to help overfish, but to improve the efficiency of the fishing effort, uh, catch your daily quota in less time and using less fuel. And then you contribute to sustainable, better management of sustainable fisheries. There are also ways in which you can use space technologies to support aquaculture industry. In fact, as we are fishing down the food chain and the harvest fisheries are struggling more and more, 
it's becoming an increasing problem to provide high quality food for the growing populations and governments are turning more and more to aquaculture. So in support of aquaculture, you can use remote sensing in many ways, but some of them are listed here. They could be to detect harmful algal bloom and to provide warning to reduce loss from these events. It might be to predict hypoxic events. And if you, in case you don't know, these are events where the oxygen levels in the water go down to such an extent that the animals find it difficult to survive and you can have mass mortality. You can use remote sensing to study the carrying capacity of a habitat. In this example here on the bottom right, you can see how um, an airborne remote sensing uh, was, um, tool was used to look at um, the grafts of aquaculture um, cultured mussels and how you see the depletion of the mussels, uh, sorry, of chlorophyll in the areas where the rafts are placed. And you can also use remote sensing back to water quality for site selection and for monitoring impact of aquaculture. Now, if it come closer to freshwater, the effects or the need for water is uh, even more obvious to see. If you look through history, you will see that typically civilizations and cities have sprung up around sources of water. And a classic example of how water dictates our entire life is uh, this uh, city called the Fatehpur Sikri that was built by the Mughal Emperor Akbar in 1571. When they designed it, they paid a lot of attention to water. They had artificial lakes and they had water channels and they had drainage channels. But when the entire population moved there, eventually it became uh, impossible to sustain the city because the water supply became insufficient from the spring on which they were dependent. So within 10 days, this entire city was abandoned. As somebody remarked in one of the papers I was reading, okay, in those days, if a city failed, you had enough land and maybe you had the money to relocate to another place. But today you have to be careful because land is in short supply, water is in short supply, and you have to make sure that we use water um, efficiently and intelligently. But water is, uh, is essential for our life, for our survival, but water quality is also related to health. And this idea that um, water and uh, air quality is uh, related to human health is not a new one. In the, if you take the example of the golden age of Islam, I think it went from the eighth century to the 14th century. They knew that their, uh, the success of their hospitals, which were called Bimaristans, depended on air and water quality. So they built their hospitals on hills or by rivers, and then they, their engineering was such that they diverted the water to flow through the courtyard and the halls of the hospital, and then the water flowed back into the river. Now in the top right-hand corner here, I have the architectural drawing of one of the hospitals where, in fact, uh, you see that at the very center of all the um, wards was a water tank with a water fountain. Uh, a famous um, physician, Abu Bakr al-Razi, 
was known to have carried out an experiment to determine water quality, no, sorry, air quality in Baghdad before he chose the site for a Bimaristan there. And the experiment he carried out was to place pieces of raw meat in different parts of the city. And he and his students monitored how fast the meat uh, became uh, decayed. And the assumption was that the place where the meat stayed fine for longest period had good air quality and therefore a good look was a good location for placing the hospital. In Islam, flowing water was considered to be good and incorporated into their architecture, whether it was for gardens, private residences, or the Turkish baths. It's interesting that uh, if you look at the Indian um, Ayurvedic uh, principles. They did not believe in flowing water, but they strongly advised boiling water before you consumed it. It's another good principle that we might um, adopt today. Um, and now my slide is not moving. Okay, so I could summarize this part of the talk by saying that our life depends on water, not just our health, but our well-being in the most, in the broadest sense of the word, whether it is for recreation or for uh, our transport and for many riches that you might extract from water. In fact, it also affected our religions. Some of the religions in the historical times went from one country to another through uh, transport, through ships. But water has many faces and sometimes it can turn on its anger on us. And the example I have here is that of the 2018 floods of Kerala, in Kerala in a region called the Vembanad Lake and surrounding areas, the, the impact was the worst. I, I understand that oh, millions of people were displaced and over 400 people died from this one instance of uh, a terrible flooding incident. But perhaps, uh, no, sorry, at that time, the uh, people did make use of uh, flood mapping from satellites to understand the magnitude of the problem. This is a newspaper article of the time that showed satellite images from Sentinel-1 produced from Europe based on the ESA census and uh, they were a val valuable source of information. But if satellite maps are to be used for effective management of response to floods, the risk maps should be timely, they should be frequent, they should be reliable, and they should reach the decision makers. And I don't think we are quite there yet in making best use of satellite information for reducing the uh, damages from uh, floods. And this problem will be dealt with in more detail again by Gemma next week. Now, I talked about this uh, particularly disastrous flood, but I wonder sometimes whether the bigger problem is not the insidious, frequent, repeated uh, occurrences of uh, natural disasters. Again, I refer to a newspaper article from this region, and they say that uh, this uh, repeated uh, flooding, torrential downpours, intrusion of saline water, and disasters such as these are wearing down the resilience of a part of our study area called Kutanad, 
which is typically considered in a, uh, commonly referred to as the rice bowl of Kerala. The floods caused tremendous uh, devastation to the flooding, uh, to the harvest of rice in that particular year. Though I also understand that the benefits of uh, nutrients from flooding led to a bumper crop the next year. Anyway, the point I want to make here is that the incidence of um, repeated occurrences of natural disasters has led to climate refugees. Some 15% of the people have already left this region, which I find is a, a sad thing, but I also like to uh, point out that this is not a unique story. But what I want to say is that this leads me to say that uh, the problem is urgent and we need to address the resilience of the human com communities to perturbations under extreme weather events associated with changing climate. So if you now look at the global picture, you see that what is happening in Kutanad and uh, Kerala and regions like that, it's not an region specific, it is not isolated. The uh, water related disasters are now a global phenomenon. It's affecting people all over the world. And according to this review paper, the number of people affected run into hundreds of millions. And uh, the health impacts of these uh, water related disasters uh, are also Im important and they continue sometimes long after the physical damages related to flooding has uh, have receded. So if uh, you partition the types of uh, diseases uh, that follow a water related uh, episode, you see that waterborne dis uh, diseases occupy a big part of the pie and it is more important during flooding and but it is still important when you have droughts. Mental problems is a big component of the health problems that follow. So for much of what follows, we are going to look more at waterborne diseases. So what is, what is the global relevance of uh, waterborne diseases? According to WHO, some 200 million cases of malaria occurred in uh, 2020 and associated uh, deaths were over 600,000. If you look at the case of cholera, there, was, there were millions of cases reported and uh, somewhere between 20,000 or 140,000 deaths were associated with cholera worldwide. See this big uncertainty in numbers. And this is a problem. There are frequently high underreporting of waterborne diseases. So remedial measures become difficult. What if we change and look at the statistics for drinking water? Because many of the diseases that we are going to look at are associated with contaminated drinking water. Again, according to WHO, some close to 800 million people lack even a basic service and about 150 million people are dependent on surface water are part of this uh, group of people who don't have enough drink a uh, um, sustained supply of drinking water and they say that even if you have drinking water it could be contaminated some 2 billion people have no guaranteed contamination free water supply. So 
Contaminated drinking water can cause up to half a million diarrheal deaths each year. And according to WHO's prediction, in about two years, half the world's population will be living in water stressed areas. And furthermore, as uh, we will we know, uh, provision of safe drinking water breaks down in extreme weather, such as flooding, and that is always frequently followed by outbreaks in uh, diseases. But in case you think that I am talking about a third world problem or a developing country problem, think again. This is a recent article that appeared in uh, BBC, and it talks about the problems with uh, sewage in waters around UK. So these statistics I found to be staggering. Water companies who are um, charged to look after the uh, treatment and discharge of sewage uh, frequently are allowed to dis discharge untreated sewage into the sea and into natural water bodies. And so the culprits are here and they add to more than up to about 2 million hours of raw discharge being uh, disposed into rivers and the seas. And this has only made the news because surfers have united against uh, mistreatment of our waters. So a group called, uh, what do they call themselves? Su uh, surfers Against Sewage, I think, something like that. And they have uh, been protesting against these and all of a sudden it is in the national news. So we cannot underestimate the role that citizens can play in correcting some of the current problems. Now, these are all health problems and we are at a course on remote sensing and water. So it might be fair to ask what's it got to do with us. The reason is that many of the factors that determine health and the outbreaks of infectious diseases or a treatment lie under the direct purview of the health sector. The other sectors involved include uh, those who are responsible for sanitation, water supply and water treatment, as we just saw, education, agriculture, trade, tourism and so on. But importantly, it also includes environmental and climate change uh, as factors that determine health. And that is the factor that we are talking about here. So what we are interested in is in looking at what uh, space technology can contribute and how can it be integrated with other sectors? Because by ourselves, we are not in a position to solve this complex problem, but we can contribute. So let's look a little bit more at the role of the environment in uh, deciding uh, public health. So in our context, the importance is uh, the role, the important aspect is the role that environment can play through waterborne and vectorborne diseases. Now, Stefano mentioned it, there is uh, evidence that diseases associated with uh, animals that are then transmitted to humans and that are referred to as zoonotic diseases are on the increase. So these diseases that are transferred from animals to humans can be classified as those that are transmitted by direct contact with the animals indirect contact or that are transmitted through some vector or the food that we consume or waterborne diseases. 
And if we look at the waterborne diseases or water associated diseases, they are a diverse group and they include those that are uh, diarrheal in their nature, such as cholera. There are um, par um, pathogens that cause skin diseases. Um, then there are those that uh, are responsible for vector borne diseases, such as malaria or dengue fever, and for the, um, yet others, such as hepatitis. Now, water fosters many types of uh, pathogens or responsible for infectious diseases, such as the Vibrio cholerae bacteria um, that is known to have many reservoirs in the water and that is responsible for cholera. Mosquitoes are responsible for many vector borne diseases such as malaria, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and they require water for completing a part of their life cycle. Uh, macrophytes or large floating vegetation, which sometimes may be invasive in certain regions, such as the water hyacinth in Wembenad Lake. And they may be very beautiful, but they can create stagnant pools, facilitating mosquito breeding. And water hyacinth is also known to be associated with Vibrio cholerae, or as a, some other uh, large uh, floating vegetation. So let's take a little bit uh, of a closer look at the genus of Vibrio that include a number of pathogenic bacteria species. Um, Vibrio cholerae that we just encountered includes some 200 serotypes, but only two that are referred to as O1 and O139 are associated with major cholera outbreaks. Vibrio alginolyticus causes wound and ear infections if you are exposed to contaminated water. Cholera bacteria, on the other hand, can only cause um, a disease if you actually drink the infected um, water or food. Vibrio parahemolyticus is associated with food poisoning and Vibrio vulnificus is a deadly one that infects wounds if you walk through contaminated water with open wounds. Uh, and if you are vulnerable, you can, uh, septicemia can follow very quickly and the mortality rate is very high. In uh, Baker, Austin's and colleagues, very good uh, summary, which I have shown here, uh, they have classified all their properties in a very nice diagram. And if you look at the genome, the important point to note here is that these organisms are uh, capable of recombining and uh, with uh, other, other organisms. And they also can do horizontal gene transfer. And uh, that leads to the evolution of the species, and it can also lead to buildup of antimicrobial resistance in the genes if uh, these uh, DNAs are in the water. So in the environment, uh, you can find them these uh, pathogens in association with fish, they may be free living or free floating, whatever you want to call it, in the water itself. They may be associated with crustaceans and they may be associated with algae. The transmission, it can be oral or through wound exposure, as I indicated here. And you can uh, come into direct contact with the bacteria, for example, by drinking the contaminated water 
and it can also be through person-to-person uh, -person transmission. So if you take a look at the um, overview of the role of the environment in uh, causing infection, sanitation conditions appear as a key problem, key factor. Environmental conditions that can dictate growth or decay, and then which in turn would determine how much bacteria are present in the water. And then these may come back to infect us, for example, through fish or seafood. The circulation and residence time and flushing rate of water bodies can also determine the growth rate and uh, again influence the pathway to uh, infection. So if you look at uh, some of these things in uh, one, one, one at a time, let's look at the environmental conditions and how they may affect growth and decay. So let's take temperature and salinity. It's been known for a long time now that temperature and salinity have an effect on growth rates of uh, Vibrio. This example is for Vibrio vulnificus, and uh, you can see that um, they don't like decreasing salinity, and uh, they have some preferred temperature beyond which uh, they don't survive too well. So, this has been taken to further extent in some work. For example, Pfeffer and uh, colleagues, they studied the uh, Vibrio and temperature in North Carolina's uh, estuarine waters. And they showed that there was a close relationship between water temperature and Vibrio uh, genus, all the species in, the, in that genus or if you take the Vibrio vulnificus by itself. And uh, this uh, relationship with the temperature was stronger than many other environmental variables that they measured, such as uh, total bacterial count, phosphorus, ammonia, salinity, and so on. There is a study that looked at the uh, North Atlantic as a whole, and they showed that uh, Vibrio abundance in the water increased with sea surface temperature. And uh, using a generalized additive model, they showed that sea surface temperature and the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation explained some 30% of the variance. And they did the analysis for the different types of uh, um, Vibrio, Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio parahemolyticus, and vulnificus. And you can see how the different uh, types of Vibrio were affected. In another very interesting study, Baker Austin and colleagues showed that there is an increasing incidence of uh, Vibrio related uh, hospitalizations, I think, uh, in, uh, high la in, in Northern Europe, and that there was a strong relationship between anomalies in sea surface temperature and incidence of Vibrio infections in Finland and Sweden. They, they use satellite data to do this, and they also point out that these occurrences of um, positive anomalies in temperature, or known as heat waves, they are becoming stronger, and the frequencies of these events are occurring, uh, are increasing in recent years. So, the based on these uh, analyses, one expects that vibriosis associated uh, with these pathogens are likely to spread northwards with higher water temperatures. So 
we also looked at um, what others have said about Vibrio cholerae in the natural environment as a function of temperature and salinity. So this is a compilation from Takemura and colleagues, and they reported that Vibrio had a preferred range between uh, 10 and about 28 degrees for high uh, numbers of Vibrio to be present. In a lab-based study, Materna and colleagues also reported that they had an optimal growth temperature of 28 degrees, but they could survive between 41 and 18 degrees centigrade. So this is a map of the seasonal variation in temperature in Vembenad Lake, our study area in Kerala that um, Stefano also referred to. In blue, we have in situ observations and in red, satellite-based observations average for the whole lake. So this is the optimal temperature for Vibrio growth as reported by uh, Materna. And we see that the temperatures in Vembenad Lake are now already reaching very high values, maybe heat waves of up to 36 degrees. So we wondered whether that might uh, push us beyond the upper limit of uh, uh, suitability for Vibrio, but people say, but Vibrio can survive very well inside the human body at 38 degrees. So it's not, uh, we can't sterilize Vibrio by letting waters warm up too much. So moving on to the aquatic uh, reservoirs of pathogens, and again, using cholera as an example, this is complex because Vibrio gets everywhere. Vibrio cholerae uh, is a naturally occurring component of uh, um, brackish and freshwater systems, and they are known to interact with um, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and uh, they can exist uh, as uh, free living organisms in the water. And if fish consume uh, infected phytoplankton or zooplankton, then the fish can transport the bacteria over long distances. If you look at their life cycle, it is generally understood that uh, contact or consuming contaminated uh, water or food can cause an outbreak of the disease. But in the interval between successive outbreaks, they have to survive in an aquatic reservoir. And this may be through phytoplankton or zooplankton or uh, uh, insect egg masses, exoskeleton, detritus. So a lot of things can um, harbor these uh, bacteria in between infections. And once it is inside a human host, you, you fall sick. And then if uh, more people come in contact with the shedding of infected material, for example, through stool, then it spreads and you have an outbreak. And they say that during an outbreak, you can have hyperinfectious vibrios and further spreading through contaminated material and so on. Um, so back to remote sensing and uh, using this information for predicting risk. Uh, there are several similar studies. I show here one by De Magni and colleagues. And they said that for um, an outbreak in uh, Calcutta in India, they could predict the outbreak of cholera cases using satellite-based chlorophyll concentration sea surface temperature, and rainfall data. 
and they used both in situ and satellite data and they were able to predict the occurrences of the cholera cases with a one month lag so the results are statistically significant and the one month lag lets you develop early warning systems so we can if you take an ex back to bring you back to the Vembanad Lake in Kerala, chlorophyll concentration is in principle readily available from satellites. But let me point out or remind you that if you are dealing with areas of persistent cloud cover, we also have to rely on in situ observations to fill the gaps. And we also need in situ observations to obtain information at depth. And I advertise Gemma's talk in next week. So given all this, what is our understanding of the ecological link between phytoplankton and Vibrio cholerae? One hypothesis is that the link uh, with phytoplankton or chlorophyll concentration from satellites it's not a direct one, it's a through zooplankton. So in this hypothesis, you will have a phytoplankton bloom, and then the phytoplankton bloom will attract zooplankton, the animals that are microscopic animals that feed on phytoplankton, and the zooplankton growth may follow a phytoplankton bloom by one to two months and then Vibrio cholerae attach themselves to zooplankton in high densities. This is an electron micrograph showing um, Vibrio uh, bacteria attached to, I think these are the mouth parts of a copy pod, a type of uh, zooplankton. And this is an uh, electron micrograph showing a copy pod carrying uh, Vibrio. So, uh, the point is that by attaching themselves, they now begin to aggregate in high concentrations, high concentrations that are sufficient to cause outbreaks. And the, this hypothesis, according to this hypothesis, there is a material called chitin contained in the carapace or the outer shell of zooplankton, and they serve as food for Vibrio cholerae. And there are many supporting evidences uh, from the laboratory to uh, show that uh, chitin promotes the growth of Vibrio. But there are other studies that have shown stronger relationships between Vibrio and phytoplankton than with um, zooplankton. In this study by Asplund and colleagues, in their analysis of data from the southwest coast of India, they showed the strongest uh, relationship between Vibrio cholerae, actually, and diatom abundance. Diatoms are a type of phytoplankton. A negative relationship with temperature and also another strong relationship with uh, chlorophyll. Copypod, they are phytoplankton, oh no, sorry, the zooplankton that I mentioned they had a less strong relationship. So they suggested that um, phytoplankton may provide resources that uh, promote the growth of phytoplankton, uh, sorry, the growth of uh, Vibrio cholerae more so than uh, top-down control by predators. They also summarize uh, many reported mechanisms that can sustain the association between phytoplankton and Vibrio bacteria. In our own studies, Anas, um, who is in the panel today, and colleagues reported that in the Vembanad Lake, back to our Vembanad Lake, Vibrio cholerae, which is labeled here in green, was found more frequently in association with uh, Vibrio cholerae than any of the other reservoirs that were examined, whether it was the sediment in red, macro, benthos, or 
animals in the bottom of the water, zooplankton and water itself. So uh, in this paper, they suggest that the Vibrio phytoplankton association could be related to activities of laminarinase, laminar, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting tongue tied, Laminar laminarinase and chitinase activities. Now, so this could uh, support another hypothesis, which is that the ecological link between phytoplankton and Vibrio could be direct, and they could be through biofilms. Now, these are um, uh, films that uh, Vibrio cholerae can form around many substances, whether they are biotic or abiotic. And the formation of these biofilms are supposed to facilitate their access to nutrients and can also serve to avoid predators. Um, but it need not be biofilms. It could also be, as we have seen, other ways of directly linking um, phytoplankton and Vibrio but without necessary intermediacy of uh, zooplankton. But here was another surprise for us. When we looked at the relationship between cholera uh, bacteria, Vibrio cholerae bacteria, and chlorophyll concentration, we found that in some parts of the lake that we were studying, the relationship was positive. There are about a couple of hundred observations here summarized. And in the other part, they relationship was negative. So what could explain this observation? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are many results that show that uh, phytoplankton um, can uh, promote Vibrio cholerae. And uh, the one explanation is that the mucilaginous uh, sheets of phytoplankton can uh, provide protection and nutrients to the bacteria. So these would be, among, along with biofilms and everything else, support the positive relationships that you observe. But there are studies that have also shown that some phytoplankton can have an inhibitory effect on the growth of uh, Vibrio bacteria. In their experiment, Olafsson and colleagues showed that um, one type of phytoplankton called Prorocentrum mecans promoted the growth of bacteria in a lab culture, whereas the addition of uh, Skeletonema costatum belonging to the diatom group inhibited it and the the Vibrio completely died out, actually. So these are dinoflagellates, I think, and this is certainly a diatom. So this kind of uh, experiments uh, might provide some explanation for why sometimes in the uh, Vembenat Lake we might find a positive relationship and sometimes a negative relationship. I think I'm running desperately out of time. So let me pass quickly through this one to show that I mentioned earlier that um, satellites, I mean, I, I mentioned that uh, floating algal vegetation could be an important factor in the story. And there are ways in which you can detect floating algal um, distributions using satellites. And uh, there are some of them, uh, at least one of them was proposed by Chumin Hu and colleagues, and we are now beginning to apply these algorithms with modifications as necessary to map uh, the um, floating algal vegetation in Vembenard Lake. So let me move on to the yet another condition that promotes infections, and that is uh, poor sanitary conditions. So. In uh, one of our studies in the Vembenat Lake, uh, we looked at the fecal contamination in Vembenat Lake and using this uh, bacteria, Escherichia coli, 
as an indicator of fecal contamination. Now, in the study, fecal contamination was well above acceptable levels, very high levels at all times, but they peaked during the monsoon season. Uh, this is a, a paper by, uh, again, uh, Anas, Abdulaziz and colleagues. So when we looked at the average uh, E. coli in the water against the rainfall, we found a strong correlation, which suggests that the rainfall is a factor that determines the water contamination by fecal material. Uh, then when we looked at the cumulative rainfall against the cell concentrations in the water, we found that the peak appeared in July. And this, these are data collected in the same year as the floods. And the floods only occurred in August. So this indicates that the, the drainage of fecal material into water starts excuse me, well before any funding, and you can actually uh, uh, reach peak contaminations before flooding. And the other argument could be that when the floods are severe, the heavy runoff could wash away some of the contamination into the water. So in our current thinking, we feel that heavy rains and monsoon uh, sustained rains, when they persist, the groundwater levels increase and at some point they begin to reach the same level as septic treatment plants, allowing for cross-contamination of bacteria with groundwater as well as the rivers. So problem could be a serious one. Now, in many of these uh, instances that I've been talking about, especially if we are talking about um, uh, current levels of uh, bacteria detected through satellites, the satellites by themselves don't give us a predictive capability for which we have to revert to mathematical models. And there are models that are available that are sometimes referred to as the SIR models, referring to susceptible, infected, and recovered components of the community. We have tried our hand at these uh, models, and we found that um, we could do something half decent with COVID in Kerala, because compared with cholera, the COVID um, disease transmission is much more straightforward with the predominant transmission route being from person to person. But we are still struggling with finding a, an effective predictive model uh, for the role uh, for waterborne disease such as um, Vibrio cholerae, something for some of you bright people to solve. Now, we've been talking about short-term predictions, and um, I want to spend my last few minutes by looking, uh, looking at uh, the big picture and the predictions over years, shall we say, related to climate change. In this uh, paper by Martinez, Urtaza, and colleagues, they studied the impact of El Nino on uh, outbreaks of uh, Vibrio related diseases. And uh, they were able to show a strong relation between uh, El Nino events and outbreaks of uh, diseases, Vibrio related diseases in, uh, I think this was in South America. Yes, South America. So they suggested that the occurrences of uh, warm water across tropical Pacific associated with El Nino serves as a corridor for transport of uh, Vibrio across long distances causing um, outbreaks of diseases. So in this uh, big picture, again, sea surface temperature appears as a key factor. In yet another interesting study, 
Escobar and colleagues looked at um, information on cholera bacteria from different locations. And then they analyzed the data is, uh, along with satellite data on SST, PAR or photosynthetically available radiation, salinity and chlorophyll A. And in their map also, they come up with these uh, long uh, corridors of favorable conditions for bacteria to survive and do well. Then they took this brief step of looking at what would happen in the future as temperature predictions change. I mean, temperatures change according to climate projections. And the result was that um, depending on how we predict projected into the future, the areas that are susceptible to these infections are, can only increase in the future. The range of expansion of suitable environment may change depending on the prediction, but all predictions according to their model suggest uh, a spreading of uh, suitable conditions for these infections uh, with increasing temperature into higher latitudes, northern and southern. And I want to now begin to conclude by mentioning the importance of data quality. Whatever analysis we might do will depend on the quality of the data. Now, satellite data are becoming increasingly readily available, freely and instantaneously, a timely manner. But it is extremely difficult to get some types of uh, disease data for completing the analysis. Now, COVID-19 was a well-studied example of um, problems related to undersampling. And uh, in this uh, report in the BBC of uh, a World Health Organization's report, they show the de excess deaths associated with uh, COVID-19 in different countries. And these are huge numbers. But they also say that all these countries, pretty much all countries, underreported the diseases. With respect to India, they said that um, 4.7 million people are thought to have died because of COVID-19 which is about 10 times higher than India's official uh, records. And of course, India has disputed the claim by WHO. So the fact remains that if we can't rely on the diseases data, then all methods for environmental uh, pre uh, predictions of these diseases based on environmental conditions will be that much less performing. And of course, the data quality tends to be higher for infectious diseases such as cholera that we have been looking at. And data quality issues tend to be worse in low income countries. And those are the countries where the burden of waterborne diseases are higher. And uh, within country differences are also important. So we need highly um, spatially and temporally resolved data for some of these analysis to be uh, to bear fruit. So these uh, points that I have been talking about, they are related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and especially those that are related to water and those that are related to hunger, health, clean water, climate, and life below water. And there are many ways in which uh, remote sensing can help. Now, SDG 6 is related to water and sanitation. And uh, SDG 6 um, has the target of protecting, restoring, 
water-related ecosystems, including wetlands, rivers, aquifers, and lakes by 2030. And we can't achieve such a target, which is just seven years away, without understanding the role of uh, bacteria and viruses that are responsible for infectious diseases. And uh, as we have been talking now, and as you will see again in the future lectures, there are um, contributions that we can make through remote sensing. And uh, there are, there is a, a need for developing better geo-referenced risk maps. And you will hear more about geo-referenced data in uh, Milton Campbell's talk in uh, three weeks' time, I think. So let me just conclude by saying that um, remote sensing offers several avenues to explore the dynamics of pathogenic organisms, uh, whether they are associated with waterborne or vector-borne diseases. But the problem is complex, and let me not at the leave you with the impression that remote sensing can do everything. It can't. So we have to work with uh, microbiologists, geneticists, modelers, health workers, social workers, and so on to uh, tackle the problem. So integration, communication, coordination, cooperation, they're all paramount. So as part of our effort to address this gap in integration, we are building a global network of uh, interested scientists uh, for learn to learn from each other. And that uh, one of those projects, the uh, main project, in fact, is called Onward, and uh, which is also along with Vigian that uh, Stefano mentioned, is also a sponsor of this training course. So that is my last slide. And I quote uh, a scientist called Thienemann. In 1925, he said, if you know the color of a lake, you also know its other characteristics. So once again, this is not anything new. Um, clever scientists knew that before. And let me stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva. That was a very detailed talk with, as always, a lot of information. Um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. There was quite a few questions, well, a, a number of questions coming through uh, during, and I'm sure we'll have a few more afterwards. Um, so uh, I think if we start, um, and again, I will say this is, um, all questions are open to the panel, so if you have something you want to contribute, please uh, raise a hand or step in. Um, so we had a number of questions uh, around um, when you were talking about water quality at the start and the variables you can measure. Um, and I was wondering if of the observations we can make, um, and that we have to validate. You said there wasn't enough information often. Which is the one that's most lacking in terms of validation? Is it validation of the optics or is it validation of the, um, let's say, the, the Vibrio data or the, the variable that you're trying to find a proxy for? Um, we get asked these kinds of questions before, and I think the answer comes back to be more or less the same, which is that what you need depends on what you want. Um, so if you are looking at water quality for primary production, say light clarity of water for light transmission for computing primary production, then you don't need Vibrio data. But if you are going to analyze the potential of disease outbreaks based on environmental bacteria, then it's important to have information on the bacteria. But if you want to link the bacteria with disease outbreaks, then you need disease outbreak data. 
and you need information on how many people were infected and when they were infected. And that kind of information is sometimes very hard to get by. So if you rephrase the question and ask me which is most difficult to get, then I'll probably tell you that it is uh, most of the time the disease data, the cases the, and uh, the time and the location. Uh, you can get some of those information at very uh, broad level from, say, WHO. They will tell you that India reported so many cases or Brazil reported so many cases. But these are big countries, so it's very difficult to relate what happened in a whole country com in relation to environmental, vari environmental variables that were changing all over the country. So it becomes very difficult unless you can get a match between the scales at which diseases occur and the scales at which environmental conditions change. And the more you look at it, more you realize that's very difficult to come by. And as I said, the uh, some countries, especially maybe tropical countries, maybe Africa, they're more difficult to come by and some other countries report very well. I think you might see in uh, Milton's uh, presentation uh, three weeks from now that Brazil has a lot of information at very fine spatial resolution. And they are able to make use of that for some predictions. Okay, let me stop there unless uh, there's more unanswered aspects to that question. No, I think it just, um, would I be right in saying that also it seems the more, well, for these studies to be able to draw useful conclusions, a lot of the time you really have to um, combine quite a lot of different data sets, whether that's human uh, health data or if it's, um, you know, remote sensing data on chlorophyll or color, but also temperature or um, salinity in some cases. There's, I mean, it's it, because you're looking at biological organisms which are responding to multiple drivers and you're combining that with humans who also have a variety of behaviors and factors, it pretty much always leads to these studies needing um, to be quite multivariate in nature when you study yeah, them. Th that is a statement I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with. And that brings up the point of uh, human behavior as being one more factor in the puzzle, right? So if you want to look at human behavior and therefore related to anomalous um, results, um, I mentioned the Kerala outbreak in 2018. Paradoxically, uh, the cholera uh, cases that were reported in association with the outbreak, it was very low, um, which was a, it, you know, on the face of it, it is a puzzle. Until you look at what the, what was done at the time and what are the habits of the people. First of all, as I mentioned, Ayurveda advises people to boil water before they drink. And at least in Kerala, that is a habit. Everybody boils water before they drink. Then during the outbreak, the government was asking all the people, whatever your condition, don't drink water without boiling it. So that was a campaign. They also distributed, um, what is it, sterilizing uh, capsules to use with the water if they didn't have uh, a chance to boil water. Many of the volunteers supplied bottled water. Uh, they used boats or whatever. Students had, uh, uh, they formed volunteer groups and uh, they communicated to each other using WhatsApps, I think, and said these people need water. So then a campaign was collect was uh, put in place to collect uh, water bottles and deliver them and so on. So human behavior becomes an important factor also in all this. Okay. Um, there was a question. So er earlier on in the talk, um, before you 
dug more into the disease side, you were talking about other aspects um, of water supporting life and, and good health. And you talked about fisheries. I know Dio is going to expand on that, I think, later uh, in his talk. But there was a question around, um, is there a need to use um, things like uh, knowledge of productive sites or identifying productive sites along with um, routine monitoring to try and not only create good fishing quotas, but make sure that you're preventing overfishing. And I guess that also comes into this human behavior thing. It's not just about us saying this area is productive or not. We have to get it into policy and then get those th policies to be obeyed by uh, the people in the in the local environment. Um, I just thought, wondered if you wanted to talk a little more on on the difficulties of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, again, back to human behavior, I guess. But um, that's another thing that uh, Trevor worked very hard at, um, and that was uh, to develop a uh, to establish the role of remote sensing in. Um, ecosystem-based management to fisheries. Now, very often the quota for fishing is um, set based on how much people caught before and if the catch is going down and then you change your quota. Very little um, information regarding the environmental conditions and the change in the environmental conditions goes into these decision-making um, channels. It's also difficult when uh, some of the effects of fishing, um, envi change, en environmental changes and related uh, changes in the fisheries recruitment might take several years before you see the result. If you are looking at um, long-lived fish, which are more common in the higher latitudes. The chain is a bit shorter if you look at small pelagics and it's a one year cycle. But uh, this uh, idea of uh, considering environmental variations as a factor in deciding fisheries quotas is uh, I think um, it's underused, shall we say. Um, there were a couple of questions around, I think it may have been answered in the text, but there was a couple of questions around whether uh, Vibrio can only grow in brackish waters, fresh waters, oceans. My understanding is it seems to be everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> um, maybe Anas or, or yourself could go into a bit more detail on that. Yes, um, I think uh, they can. Anas, maybe time for you to step in. But my reading is that you find them in the, in the sea. This, you find them in brackish water, you find them in fresh water. So there is no um, haven of uh, safety. Yes, yes. I uh, see, yes, ma'am, that uh, Vibrio, came, Vibrio are ubiquitous and they they are found everywhere. And there are some, you know, the tolerance of different species of Vibrio towards different uh, levels of salinity may vary. For example, Vibrio cholerae is good at growing in uh, uh, 15 PSU salinity up to that they grow better. So the growth rate may differ, but uh, they all found everywhere, the marine ecosystem also. So when, when we were considering those risk maps and, you know, you were pondering the the thought that if the lake got warm enough, you know, uh, the, the current dominant species might not be so happy. It could just be succeeded by another species that's better at those temperatures, right? Precisely, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the, but here is the thing to emphasize, I think. Uh, we have to accept that uh, these bacteria are a natural component of our ecosystems. So there is no ambition for eliminating them. Uh, if you take the humans out of the equation, they do have a constructive role to play in the ecosystem. They are, for example, uh, contributing to the carbon cycle and so on. So there are a few things that we should worry about. One is uh, 
is um, the human influence on the ecosystem shifting the uh, concentrations or the abundance of these bacteria relative to those that can control them, the natural system? Are we disturbing them in favor of pathogenic bacteria and fecal contamination and so on? Those things you, you do need to try and control. The, the other problem that worries me is that um, the fecal contamination also brings into the water bacteria that have acquired resistance to antibiotics. And as I mentioned, these um, pathogenic bacteria have uh, mechanisms by which they can collect DNA for it, and which may have which may be DNA with uh, antibacterial resistance into their own system. So they become antibacterial and that uh, resistant. So that is a scary thought. And uh, if Anas wants to el elaborate, I think in our, the study area, we also found that a lot of bacteria were resistant to a number of common antibiotics. We should try to stop that. And we should try to stop the magnitude of outbreaks when they do occur. Uh, uh, the, for infection to take hold, you do need to, in, if it is cholera, you do need to consume a lot of bacteria. I think it was uh, some threshold that I read about. I always scared to quote numbers because I may get them wrong, but it was like, thousand cells per liter or something. So, uh, by the way, if you are reading about these things, I re sincerely suggest that you read all the papers you can get out by somebody, a scientist from the US called Rita Colwell and her colleagues. And in one of her, their um, attempts to find a solution, they suggested simple filtration using cotton material that the women in Bangladesh wear, folded four times, you filter them, and they found that if they did that, they reduced their occurrences by about 99%. It's not that the filtered water were free of the bacteria, but the numbers were sufficiently reduced to avoid an outbreak. So anyway, I'll stop there. I think Anas was trying to step in there as I invited him to, then I kept on talking. Anas, over to you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I know that it is, it is there, it is ubiquitous in the marine environment, and they have their own role to play in the biogeochemical cycling of nutrients. So, but when uh, this started causing the diseases, there is some threshold limit uh, above which, uh, you know, they can cause the diseases. To the humans or the aquatic animals. Otherwise, uh, if it if maintained in the lower number of cells, even in aquaculture systems, they are actually you know they are doing their job perfectly and the system is healthy. And uh, when it increases, it causes diseases. As uh, Shubham said, uh, again the scary thing is the antibiotic resistance. And when, uh, you know, the sewage or the uh, anthropogenic input or the bacteria from fecal contaminants or the bacteria which are exposed to the, uh, to the antibiotics or chemicals are reaching to the environment and where they, they exchange the genes and others also can become antibiotic resistance. And this, this, this transfers to the food chain and causing the problem or severe. So that causes, you know, even the treatment of human diseases very difficult. And uh, adding to the, you know, the controlling measures or how we disinfect or how we purify water when we filter using the muslin, the sari cloth, that was a, uh, one proposed in Bangladesh. So what they were doing, 
uh, was when filtering they avoid the superlanguins and the load of this vibrio is reduced drastically so it is bringing down down to the you know below the optimal or threshold similarly in kerala also in many places the solar disinfection of water or even in our own power research program which we are using the photodynamic therapy in which uh, you know using the light therapy we can kill some of the reduce the number of these pathogens in the natural ecosystem so, so there are different ways uh, you know uh, this uh, pathogen number can be reduced in the ecosystem that's it um a quick one that i'll i'll address but there's been a couple of questions around um uh people who are I think excited by the material um, and, and interested in all the topics that we've been covering, but they're not sure how they might go about um, trying to process data or um, work with the data. Um, that will come later in the course. So we have modules at the end that go into coding practices and we'll have, I think, examples of, of scripts and how to use software such as Snap and CDAS for manipulating satellite images. So please bear with us, that will come. Uh, we're just making sure that, um, you know, at the minute people are thinking about um, applications that they might find useful. And then uh, we've already shown you where you can start to get hold of data. And at the end, there'll be uh, how to to get stuck in yourself. Um, coming back to the topics covered today, um, there was a number of questions around uh, the resolu high resolution required or the resolutions required, and um, the quality of the data in the coastal zone, which I think we've we've covered in a couple of the last lectures about. You know, we know the data is sometimes um, uh, either has a higher uncertainty uh, or has more sources of potential error. Yeah. Uh, when we move into the very close uh, coastal areas uh, and high resolutions, but um, I don't know if uh, yourself, uh, Shiva, Hema, or Lauren want to talk about um, how much confidence we can have, even knowing those errors um, in the data sets that have been used for some of the flood mapping or the chlorophyll uh, data sets. Yeah, I can only um, re-emphasize what we have all said before. When we use sensors that are uh, designed for land applications without the right spectral resolution or without the right spectral sensitivity, remember Lawrence talk about sensitivity, sensitivity, and sensitivity. We don't have that. And nor do we have the, um, well, the, um, the time resolution needed for some of the problems. We need sometimes information every day and you don't get that. So there are several limitations to what can be done with these satellites. The only thing you can do is at this stage is move with caution. Check what you are doing, check if the resolution is good enough, check if the errors are acceptable. But for the young ones listening, you have yet another option, and that is to move agencies such as ESA and NASA to give us better instruments in the future. But if you want to ask ESA or NASA for better instruments, you have to show them why what you have now is not sufficient. So it's a step-by-step -step process. Some of them may be long, but you have options. So I leave it to Hema and to Lauren. Okay, I was just going to add, and Shiba already mentioned this in her talk as well, that it's also important to consider the region you're studying and whether the data and the algorithms you use are appropriate for that region. Um, so that's just what I wanted to add. Well, you will go into some of those in some more detail. Yes, definitely next week. Yes. Um, there's very little I can add to that. I think you've answered perfectly, except to say, to reiterate what you said earlier is um, it really depends on what you're looking for as well. Sometimes this can work well and disappointingly and other times it's not as transferable because of some other contributing factor. Um, and I think we've managed to say this quite well throughout the seminar series so far. Um, 
Remote sensing is not a perfect tool. It's a very good tool at elevating point measurements. The key being uh, the more validation data we have and the more, I like this, the more pressure we put on ESA to give us uh, instruments with high spatial resolution and exceptionally high sensitivity, which I feel is only a matter of time, then the more chance we have of really being able to quantify this and qualify this with, with higher and higher accuracy. But I, th I think that was answered already quite well. Um, so I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, there was a question, and I, obviously I don't think uh, it, we have time here to answer this fully. Um, the question is, uh, in Angola, malaria is very common. This was in your list of uh, uh, water-associated diseases, Shiva. And um, the, uh, the, the attendee was curious about how you might apply some of these methodologies that you covered around Vibrio, I think, to reduce that disease. And I guess that would be things like risk maps. And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that you'd be able to directly map um, malaria or mosquitoes that, you know, detecting those. But if we can find associations or we can find driving factors, uh, then the general approaches for risk mapping, forecasting, um, and those sorts of things would be applicable across other diseases. Yeah, indeed, that is the the idea that um, um, many of the principles that we discussed here around waterborne diseases would also be applicable to uh, vector-borne diseases. But the factors may change. For example, um, I don't know the setup in uh, Angola, but uh, in Kerala, I think it would be fair if I said that the mosquito population will uh, grow rapidly if you have um, some incidence of rain. So precipitation uh, would become more of an important factor for malaria. Then um, stagnant water favors malaria. Uh, so if uh, you can get uh, circulation patterns also available through satellites, that might help. What can I, uh, so these uh, water or macrophytes on the water may harbor micro environments favorable for mosquitoes. That could be a factor. So that is what I would advise. You begin by looking at the ecology of the vector and then see what we can do about monitoring the ecological factors and relate that to conditions when we should beware of uh, the uh, potential risk from mosquitoes. Uh, okay, I think with a few minutes to spare, we'll we'll close it there. I think, um, as I'm sure everyone's got full days and uh, might need a few minutes before the next uh, engagement. So, um, thank you very much for the lecture, Shuba. Uh, it was fascinating. Thank you, panel, for the discussion. Thank, and thank you, you very much, all of you. Thank you for your patience. And bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you, Stefano.